Okay, tonight I have uh, certainly the special privilege of introducing a longtime friend of mine. I've had the pleasure of working with Congressman Brady for many years. I don't believe that you'll find a stronger advocate for our country and our families. I'm excited to see that Congressman Brady has taken on even bigger roles for helping to lead House conservatives this Congress. And I'm sure he'll speak some on, uh, about those things tonight. I ask that you please join me and welcome our host this evening, my friend and our congressman for the 8th District of Texas U.S. House of Representatives, Kevin Bray. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Well, first, let me, um, let me thank uh, Troop Leader Brian White and the Scouts. I, I think any event that starts out with Scouts posting the colors is a good event, don't you think? I mean, I, I just love it. I was a Scout myself. Many of you were. And, and Troop Leader uh, White uh, brought with him the, the young men posting the colors, Duncan Hare, Nick Jones, Zach uh, uh, Hammond, Blake Morrell, and Kent Emden. Fellas, thank you very much for scouts, and stay on the path to your Eagle Scout. I guarantee you it'll be worth it, okay? Uh, I also want to thank Sheriff Gage, kind enough uh, both to kick off this event tonight, but more importantly, you know, does a terrific job as our sheriff. We have a county that's growing and growing and growing in every corner. You know, and with it comes more challenges. He and his deputies do an amazing job covering our county, our community, our families, uh, our neighborhoods. So, Sheriff, where'd you go? Sheriff, thank you very much for all you do. <laughs> this is, thanks for coming tonight. This is, the, um, this is the first of a series of town halls we're going to hold to talk about the dangerous deficits this country faces what the consequences of that debt are and what we can do to start turning these things around. I have two of my favorite people with me tonight, uh, one from Washington uh, and one from Bryan College Station. Tom Schatz is president of uh, Citizens Against Government Waste. Uh, he was against pork before against being pork was cool. Uh, and, and his full bio uh, here is, uh, is really remarkable. He's president of uh, Citizens Against Government Waste and its lobbying affiliate, the Council for Citizens Against Government Waste. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational foundation. But here's what it does it works to eliminate waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement in government. It's got one million members strong and growing, uh, and they have been in the, the lead for cost cutting. Uh, savings uh, in the country. In fact, their recommendations have helped save taxpayers over $1 trillion. Uh, he has testified numerous times in Washington on all these issues. Uh, he has a long uh, history of understanding um, how Congress works and, more importantly, how it doesn't work when it comes to saving money. I'm going to, after I make some introductory slides and talk about it, I'm going to introduce Tom, Tom and our next guest as well. But Tom, thanks for joining us today. Can you give him a warm Texas welcome? Our other speaker today, uh, Dr. Tom Savings, is from Bryan College Station. In fact, I had the privilege of representing Dr. Savings in our first congressional district that went uh, up to Brazos County, but I also serve on number two Republican on Social Security, and we, he has been a leader in the forefront of reform of Social Security and Medicare. He's been serving on the, uh, on the trustees since, I think, 2000, 2001. Uh, he's been an uh, outspoken uh, critic of, um, of the problems with the, uh, the entitlements today. Uh, he is director for the Private Enterprise Research Center. Uh, his degree in economics from Michigan State, degree from the University of Chicago, has served on the faculty of University of Washington and Michigan State University. Uh, is, a num is a member of a number of editorial boards, very impressive uh, resume. He's uh, uh, authored so many academic articles and policy um, uh, books about monetary economics. Again, he has been a, uh, served as a public trustee of the Social Security Medicare Trust Fund um, since 2000. 
And uh, we're delighted, Dr. Savings, to have you here today as well. <laughs> Let me go through a couple quick um, uh, slides, sort of set the tone before we get to this discussion tonight. These, um, I called these dangerous deficits to begin this forum for a reason. Because as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the finances of America, you realize just how much trouble we are in. And how the spending of the last few years may well take us a decade or more to, to dig out from under. But we have to dig out from under. We have to get a country that's living within its means again. And it's not just numbers. It's not just numbers. It's about the role of the federal government the limit on the federal government, and more importantly, the unlimited freedom that we as people need to restore in America. So we're going to talk about that. Um, t Tom Schatz and Tom Savings will be here today. This is the president's budget that he just proposed on Valentine's Day. I didn't think it was such a loving message myself. Um, uh, but if you look, uh, uh, it was a huge budget. The taxes more, spends more, borrows more than any time in history, at $1.6 trillion of new taxes on a, literally every American, energy companies, local banks, families, seniors, small businesses. The president, I always put this slide up because the president often complains about the uh, deficit he inherited, and he did inherit one. But I asked my Joint Economic Committee staff, I said, you know, tell me what the, what the projected deficits were on the day the president took office and what it is today, two years later. And this is this chart right here. The uh, blue lines at the bottom there is what the Congressional Budget Office uh, laid out as America's deficits over the next 10 years. And this is the red lines, our President Obama's deficits. Uh, he is quadrupling the deficits in America um, over the next 10 years. Uh, he's almost, in his first term, well, almost doubled the size of government. Um, and, a, and that explosion is just getting ready to take off. The uh, tidal wave of debt, this comes from a budget. This is actually the more encouraging chart. It's hard to believe, isn't it? This is only America's debt that we've actually borrowing. It's our public debt. We go out and people buy it. This doesn't include the debt in Social Security and Medicare and other entitlements. It's much worse than that. But what it shows is that historically, since World War II, we've had a pretty low debt as a percentage of our economy. That's how countries typically um, measure th their finances. But no more. We're at, just in publicly held debt, we're at 60%. Dr. Sabin will point out, if you count our Social Security and Medicare, our debt is, this year, will be 100% of our entire economy. We will owe as much as our entire big thriving economy itself. Every economist tells us that when you get to, country gets to 90% of its debt, that it economic engine, it slows down. Uh, and in truth, it does. Uh, and the deficits that we're facing going forward um, today, a child born today um, owes $45,000 to the government. He owes a Lexus to the government. By the time he's 13, he'll owe a second Lexus to the government. By the time he or she gets out of college at age 22, gets ready for their first job, they'll owe a third Lexus to the government if we don't change things. But in truth, people don't buy cars in the United States. They pay for these deficits another way. In the threat of higher taxes that robs their paycheck each and every day of their life, they pay for it in slower economic growth, so fewer job opportunities. Lower business investment, that's what, hap that's what creates jobs in America. You can take anything in the world you want. It's business investment that drives our economy time and time again. They'll pay for it in a lower dollar and higher interest rates and less opportunity. That's what, that's what young people will pay if we don't get our um, deficit uh, under control. Um, and as this chart points out, if we don't change things, we face a deficit that is, um, that is absolute debt and deficits that are absolutely frightening going forward. Um, here, here's the challenge. Um, this is how your federal government spends its money. A lot of, you'll hear a lot of discussion in Washington, and Tom Schatz is going to talk about this, about discretionary funding, which is there's two charts there, just defense and the rest of discretionary funding, education, um, uh, veterans, um, 
uh, health and human services is 666 billion. Defense is a little more than that. But as you can tell from this pie chart, a lot of the federal government's budget is on autopilot. Uh, our entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other mandatory programs like food stamps, welfare, um, ag subsidies. If any of you follow me on Facebook, I recognize some people here today. You'll always see one guy on there, Kevin Smith, complaining that I didn't vote to add another entitlement for people who live in New York and happen to live around the World Trade Center. And you'll see him complaining time and time again. The reason we can't add more entitlements is that it is swallowing our budget, almost two-thirds of it today, and it continues to grow in the future. This is uh, what drives our debt. Uh, this is a chart looking outward on our entitlements, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. And uh, it, it tells you that with the revenue, the U.S.'s revenue over time stays relatively consistent around, say, 19% or so of our economy. It's the spending that drives our deficit going forward and debt going forward. And soon, if we don't make changes, uh, it will swallow, our entitlements will swallow every dime of our budget, every dime. There won't be a dollar for defense, there won't be a dollar for veterans or for border security, period unless we get a grasp on our entitlements. And there really isn't a choice. Social Security, Medicare, as Dr. Savings will tell you, are unsustainable today. Um, and so unless we move soon to, to preserve them and to change the way they work going forward for younger generations, we're not going to be where we need uh, to be. I was encouraged. <laughs> this is my... Uh, this is my strategy. No, it's not. An, the strategy is not to stick an elephant's trunk in your car. Um, uh, but the truth is, as you'll hear tonight, our deficit and debt are so large, uh, you can't eat it in one bite. I know it's sort of, and, I, and I've had to rethink my strategy on this because it's easy for me to think, okay, if we can just get enough savings in this stopgap measure to fund the rest of the year, or we can just get enough savings in the budget that's coming up in the next few months, or in the if we can leverage the debt ceiling vote for enough, we'll get it under control. All those are important, not one of them enough to do it. In fact, we are, you know, I almost imagine a football field, but I almost imagine a 10-mile football field where the challenge isn't just to keep moving, you know, the savings ball forward and forward and forward, but understanding that we simply can't stop. This isn't this year. It isn't next year. It's not the year after that. We have to persist, persist, persist in savings at every opportunity and do it until we finally get control uh, of our budget and, and of our future. I was encouraged. I wish you could have been with me these first two months of the new Congress, especially in the House. You would love our 87 new Republican members of the House. They are great people, they're leaders in their community, they're small business people who know what it's like to meet, meet a budget, make a payroll, create jobs. They're determined to change the financial path of our country. They're skeptical of government at every level. They want to understand every vote they're taking on and they are like the cal for us conservatives, they're like the cavalry coming to the rescue. And, the, and we got to see this in this, this new speaker, John Boehner did something that no speaker has done I, not since I've been there, Tom, and I don't know before, when we introduced the uh, bill, they call it the continuing resolution, but the bill to fund the government the rest of the year, uh, for the last four years, we've had no chance to offer a single amendment to bills. We don't even get a substitute. We don't even present, we can't present another idea on the House floor. This speaker said anyone in the House of Representatives who has an idea on how to cut the budget Bring your amendment to the floor. I don't care who you are, which party you are. You can join together. I don't care. And you just, if you can convince the House to make that cut, then your amendment goes forward. And by the way, he said, I'm going upstairs to my office and I have a smoke. He's, apparently he's a smoker. So <laughs> the point being, you know, none of this I'll tell you what to do. He said, this is the people's house. And as a result, we had over 500 amendments on how to cut the size of the federal government. We went four days and nights, worked till 4.30 in the morning the last night. And for many of us, we were just pinching ourselves. You know, we'd never had that many votes, that many ideas, that many opportunities 
to cut the federal budget. And, and we did some good work, not, a, not enough. As I said, we've got so much work to do, but the bill itself, $100 billion off the budget for this year, 61 off actual spending from last year, it's just a start, it's, it's a down payment. And I know, people, I know people are screaming bloody murder, murder in Washington. That may be big savings by historical standards. I mean, someone said five times larger than anything in history, but it's a drop in the bucket. It's one fifteenth of our deficit. I mean, it's one fifteenth, not of our whole budget, of, of our deficit. If we can't do that, if we don't have the political will to do that, how are we going to tackle all those deficits going forward? But some of the amendments that passed, um, some of it in a blur because we were, it was fun. It was a ball. Eight amendments to block, pa eight amendments passed the House to block funding to implement Obamacare. Yeah, from, yeah. From mandates to exchanges and everything else, an amendment passed overwhelmingly to defund the czars in Washington, which is good. Overwhelming amendment to prohibit funding for Planned Parenthood because taxpayer dollars shouldn't be used for abortion. We passed amendments, some of them led by Texans, to defund the EPA's uh, effort to regulate greenhouse gases, expand ethanol. Yeah. We prohibited the Justice Department from requiring gun dealers to report multiple sales of rifles and shotguns uh, to the same person. And we cut uh, $450 million that would have funded an unnecessary second engine to the Joint Strike Fighter, which is a pretty good chunk. And by the way, that's something Speaker John Boehner supports, and we cut his project, just so you know. Um, but you know, it wasn't all... Uh, it wasn't all encouraging. House Republicans, the Republican Study Committee that I serve on the board of, the steering committee of, we offer an amendment to cut an additional $22 billion on top of that so we would hit all of the $100 billion pledge in discretionary funding. Only 147 of us voted for that. And then a freshman, uh, Mick Mulvaney, offered an amendment to take spending down to the 06, 2006 levels, even deeper. Only 93 of us voted for that amendment. So we still got some work to do when it comes to getting the votes to cut the spending at the level we have to. I want to finish with this. And if there's anyone from PETA here, I'm really not suggesting to eat an elephant. <laughs> but having used that analogy, let's stick with it. Um, we've got some opportunities coming up here uh, in the next few months, all of them distinct but all of them part of the effort to keep fighting for cuts, getting everything we can from a Democrat Senate Dem uh, and a White House, coming right back, fight again for more cuts, come right back, stop gap, continuing resolution. We started with the down payment. As you're reading in the paper, we've proposed $100 billion, 61 in cuts from last year. They're proposing $6 billion. Big gap. 2012 budget coming out in April, we will include entitlement reform, the first steps on entitlement reform. That hasn't been defined yet, um, but I know they're working on it, and they're going to start with Medicare, my belief. Debt ceiling is April, May, June, maybe July. This is where we're, we're going to be seeking not just savings, but spending reforms, um, retooling that plant in Washington that is designed to spend getting some budget reform, some real reforms, either cap the size of the government, give us new budget tools, retool that plant. The U cut weekly, uh, we bring to, a, uh, to the floor each week a cut that the American people um, identify. We lay out online five ideas. You vote on them. We bring them to the House floor to vote on them. We've cut um, uh, the presidential election campaign. You know that checkoff box you've got? Talk about an idea whose time has come and gone. Saves a half a billion dollars by cutting that. that pro I don't know, some of our presidential candidates may not be excited, but as a taxpayer, good, go, leave. Um, but, we're, but, but tell you the challenge. Uh, we proposed 100, you proposed, and we brought the floor, uh, you cut $179 million from UN voluntary assessments. Um, yeah, well, listen to, wait, wait till you hear the story. I thought this was a no-brainer. No Here's why. 
we pay assessments to the United Nations, and we have voluntary assessments. In all that voluntary assessments, there's a pool of money that we pay in that over the years we've overpaid by $179 million. So this you cut, you voted on, we brought the floor, simply said, we want our money back. We overpaid it, you've got it, give it to us. It failed on the House floor because uh, the United Nations wants to harden the UN against terrorist attacks, so they decided the United States ought to pay $100 uh, million out of, that, out of that fund for it. That's not what that money's for. Um, and by the way, uh, there's a whole lot of other countries that ought to pay for hardening of that facility, but one state talked to enough members, called it Homeland Security, and defeated the point being good ideas aren't enough. We're going to have to work votes and work principles on every vote we get going forward uh, in Washington. Finally, coming right after that, 2012 appropriations, 12 bills uh, that Tom Schatz has been very instrumental in on the discretionary side, uh, all of which we're going to be looking to do, again, significant savings. Uh, I didn't mean to take uh, too much time at the outset, gentlemen, uh, because um, uh, I really want to get to you. Uh, if, you if we could, uh, let's start. Uh, Tom, uh, would you, Dr. Saving, would let me look at the agenda. Both Tom. <laughs> Both Tom. That was an easy one to do, wasn't it? If we could, because discretionary is the uh, issue uh, going forward at this time, if I could uh, invite Tom Schatz, President of Citizens Gov Against Government Waste, to address. And again, Tom, thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you, Congressman. And I, uh, I want to point out that when uh, Congressman first represented this area, I came up here uh, and we talked about the Sunset Commission. Yep. And unfortunately, most of those programs are probably still in existence because that didn't happen. But he's correct in talking about how long this is going to take. But it was a big step last November. There's no question about it. And one of the biggest examples of that is this vote on the alternate engine for the Joint Strike Fighter. We've been working on this since 2004. Uh, the Department of Defense doesn't want it. Under President Bush, Secretary Rumsfeld, they said no. President Obama, Secretary Gates, they said no. No one at the Pentagon wants it. This engine is made by General Electric, so we used to say the, un the only general that wants it is General Electric. <laughs> and they're happy with this single engine in the Joint Strike Fighter made by Pratt & Whitney. And there have been millions of dollars spent on both sides. Two years ago, the Senate voted to kill this engine, $450 million earmark for the Pentagon each year. Last year, the House voted to keep it. As the Congressman said, John Boehner and, in fact, Eric Cantor and most of the Republican leadership voted to keep funding this engine. Then along came November. And not only did November happen, but the earmark moratorium occurred for the first time in many, many years. The vote came up last month. And 233 members of the House voted last year to keep the funding. This year, 231 voted to kill it. So you had a 60-vote swing, and there's your new Republican members. But as the Congressman said, not all of these amendments passed. But we're now talking about how much to cut, not how much to spend. And we've long maintained that if members of Congress are afraid of losing their jobs because they're not cutting enough spending, as opposed to going home and spending a lot of money and talking about some project named after them and thinking that's how they'll get reelected, that message changed in November. We now have more members of Congress than I can ever remember who are running of a platform, on a platform of saying we're going in to change Washington, vote to cut spending, and it's all because of people like you who have gotten involved in this effort. In the early 90s, our lobby norm the Council for Citizens Against Government Waste held a series of rallies around the country called Taxpayers Action Day. So we don't want to take credit for the Tea Party, but we were there a while ago. And that wasn't the first time that happened either. But we had rallies in Houston, Detroit, major cities. By the way, there was no social media, so we did it the old-fashioned way with phone calls and radio talk shows and mailings. And we got out 10,000 people in Detroit and thousands in many other cities. The message was sent, we want to change in Washington. And in 1994, we had a Republican takeover of the House. The problem is we stopped holding the rallies. We thought once they got there, everything will be fine. They'll just go and cut spending. And for a little while, they did. 
But they also started talking about getting money in the form of earmarks to bring back home because that's what they thought would get them reelected. We put out the first congressional pig book in 1991. So the congressman said it was a long time ago before earmarks honestly were the word. It was pork barrel spending, the old fashioned member of Congress adding a project nobody wanted in the middle of the night to a bill that nobody would read and then they'd vote on it the next day. That changed after the Republicans lost the majority in 2006 when they went up to $29 billion in earmarks from where they started at $3.1 billion. Democrats, to their credit, made earmarks more transparent. They didn't get rid of them, but that transparency helped expose the process and eventually when the Republicans agreed to the moratorium in the House, it forced everybody else to go along. The President said it in the State of the Union and eventually Democrats in the Senate went along as well. Now what this does is it does eliminate that $16.5 billion in earmarks, but it also eliminates all the time that the appropriations staff spend reviewing these thousands of requests from constituents to add earmarks. There were 30,000 of these on an annual basis. It means they have more time to examine how we're spending our money and what we need to do to change how Washington works. We do a lot of things in relation to spending, one of which is to identify a porker of the month every month. <laughs> Last August, that porker of the month was Congressman Hal Rogers of Kentucky. When it looked like the Republicans were about to take over, he was one of the three leading candidates to become chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And along about September, October, they're interviewing the three, and it's soon after Congressman Rogers has been named as the Porker of the Month, and he said, you know, if I become chairman, I'm going to call Citizens Against Government Waste and ask them where to cut spending. And he kept that promise, because we got a call from a person at the Appropriations Committee whose sole job it is to go out and speak to groups like CAGW to find out what they're thinking and what they recommend to cut wasteful spending. So again, this is all about the change in November because Hal Rogers, among many other things, once had a parkway named after him in Kentucky. He claims it wasn't his idea, by the way. It used to be the Daniel Boone Parkway. <laughs> I think more of you have heard of him than Hal Rogers. <laughs> I'm not sure about our kids in today's education system, but I'm pretty sure you've all heard of Daniel Boone. But this is what we were dealing with for a very long time, and it was a very long fight. So the earmarks we first identified, remember, 1991, 20 years later, they haven't eliminated them, they have a moratorium. It's hard to see how if Republicans take over the Senate they would bring them back, but they might. So keep the pressure up. You don't have to worry about the congressman. But I know you're all connected around the country with a lot of other people. And our agenda to bring this down to a level that is more reasonable over time is going to take a lot of work. So it's not just getting them here or there. It's not just getting involved. It's keeping this going. Because there's nothing more important than reminding people of why they are there and why they're supposed to be, why they have, about keeping their promises, about making sure that we move this huge amount of money and debt in the other direction. As long as we can keep the debate over how much to cut, and what they're talking about is not a lot in a $3.7 trillion budget. We have a proposal, and I know some of you have taken our Prime Cuts, the green book there, and, and by the way, our website, in case you want to look at more, is CAGW.org. You can download this document. It's got 730 circuits. 736 recommendations to save $2.2 .2 trillion over five years. There are a lot of other proposals. The congressman has $136 billion, I believe, in, in one year. So all these ideas are there. We just need 218 in the House and pretty much 60 in the Senate and someone that will sign those bills into law. And it will take a long time because it took a long time to get here. A lot of it has happened in the last two years because of the stimulus, which we know didn't work, because of health care, because of all these other things that they have done. Uh, there have been program increases, in some cases, that have been 500 times what they used to be. You can't spend that kind of money that quickly. And one final thing, and I, again, I encourage people to look at this. Uh, in November and in January and again later in this month, we've been running an ad on national television called The Chinese Professor. Uh, some of you may have seen this. <laughs> And this ad is an ad that includes a Chinese professor, obviously. But as he enters the stage, he 
He starts speaking in Chinese to a class of Chinese students. Talks about how great nations have fallen, Rome, Great Britain, United States. And then he talks about how countries that have failed to live up to their principles have disappeared, have gone under. And eventually at the end he says, essentially that China owns the United States. They, talking about Americans, he says, they work for us. And we plan to get this ad out as much as possible. We will also be doing more of a series of ads in relation to the impact of the debt on the American people. Now, I'm a baby boomer, fairly obviously. My father was part of the greatest generation. He's 91, fought in a battle of the bulge. He's still around. He's not here tonight, but he's still around. <laughs> and I always think about one of Jefferson's expressions that we should leave, we shouldn't leave a burden of debt to the next generation. We're supposed to leave a higher standard of living. So it's up to us to save this, save this nation from a fiscal disaster so that our children and grandchildren can enjoy a better standard of living. And we all have to keep doing this and we need to work much harder than we already have to make it happen. So thank you very much for having me tonight. Not even going to uh, do anything more here. All right, I've I've got well, I need this gadget right here to be able to talk to you a little bit about entitlements. I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to explain entitlements to both to members of Congress uh, and, and the House and the Senate over the past decade. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on because a lot of the deficits that uh, Congressman Brady talked about that are in the president's budget. As you get to the out years of that budget, those gigantic deficits are really a function of the, entitle, the, the, the entitlement program that we have. Let's see if I can get this one. Oops. Okay. Is that uh, this button here is supposed to move the things forward? It's blinking, yes. <laughs> All right. Is there anyone up there? We are. All right. All right. Let's get. <laughs> I don't know that this is working, but we'll see what's going on. I'm not, I'm not going to have many words up here. A lot of pictures, but this, the issues that we have, uh, workers pay for the expenditures of retirees. That, that's true. It looks a wonderful thing. It sounds, like, it sounds great. But those, the tax rates that workers are going to have to pay depend on it. some of them are very important things. How, um, the per retiree expenditures. What are we, we going to give retirees? Secondly, how many of them are there? Thirdly, how many workers are there? How much are workers going to make? And that all has to do with economic growth. If workers don't make enough money, tax rates are going to have to be high if we're going to give retirees a lot. Now, I know you guys don't want me to suffer so that you would certainly want to give me a lot. But on the other hand, uh, the retired population, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on past fertility. That's already over, of course. We have this baby boom. These people right here, here you saw one of them. They're going to cause us a lot of trouble. That is, if you're, if you're young. Uh, then there's fertility rates. Fertility rates are falling. We're the only developed country in the world that has fertility rates anywhere near population sustaining rates. Every other developed country has fertility rates far below population sustaining rates. They are in much worse shape than us. That shouldn't make us feel happy because of the kind of shape that we're actually in. Uh, so we, we've got labor force participation rates. Here we are. All right. This is the growth of the Medicare population. Just think about that for a moment. Here we are with 47 million people on Medicare. It's going to go up by 50% in 10 years. In 10 years, there's going to be a 50% increase in the number of people getting Medicare benefits. In 20 years, it's going to be almost double what it is now. The next, those are the, and that's the baby boom. We can't do anything about it. They're already here. We can do something. I mean, we could put them on an ice floe and give them a cake and say bon voyage and send them away. But we're not likely to do that. And if we don't do that, we're going to have to pay for it. And this is what's going to happen to the number of workers per retiree. It's now about three. It's going to fall to two in 20 years. A country like Japan, it's going to be one worker per retiree in 20 years. Can you imagine that? If, if retirees got 50% of their income, the workers would have to give up half their income just to support them. Japan's in much worse shape than us. Let's talk about the future cost of Medicare. Here you have Medicare, Social Security, and, and, and this is just a percent of federal income tax revenues. And I used to, I tell my fellow trustees, because this, uh, Congressman Brady already talked about this, 
you know, we often represent these debts in terms of the gross domestic product. That's the nation's income. And I used to tell my fellow trustees, and they have the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Commissioner, and there were only two of us who weren't really in the government. And I'd say, you know, that may be the way the North Koreans would think about this, because the dictator of North Korea owns the gross domestic product. I said, the people, this is the United States. We own the gross domestic product. The, we're, and we're letting the government use some of it. And the amount we're letting them use is federal income taxes. So we're looking here and saying that as a percent of federal income taxes, it's going to be in 10 years, 45% of federal income taxes have to, go to, have to go to Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. In 20 years, 71% of all federal income taxes will have to go to these programs. So government's going to have to get a lot smaller. That's what Congress and Brady are working on. Or your taxes are going to have to go up a lot. And the taxation solution, let's just suppose we were to, and this is just, uh, this is Medicare and Social Security. And this lets government stay the same size as it is right now. So we're going to let the rest of government stay the same size. And now we're, what we're going to do is we're going to pay for Medicare and Social Security, and we're going to pay for it with payroll taxes. Right now, those payroll taxes are like 14.5%. In 10 years, they would be 20%. In 20 years, they'll be 25% of payroll. By the, uh, by the end of this 75 years, which we always like to talk about, uh, they'd be 50% of payroll. Can you just imagine payroll taxes at 50% of payroll? Federal income taxes at 20%, that's 70% of payroll. Your state taxes at 15%, that's 85% of payroll. Well, that's, who's going to show up for work? <laughs> and as, as, we, as I used to say, I used to say, well, it's like the Soviet Union. The workers would say, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. You know, that, it can't work. This cannot happen. Now, on the other hand, we can let the elderly pay. As I've said, you don't want me to pay, but we, we might want to start this after I'm finished. But <laughs> in any case, right now, if we, let the, if we just said we're going to combine all of Medicare, and that's the way any reform that we talk about should do that, combine all the parts of Medicare, make it like whatever, and let's then have one premium that people are going to pay, and we're going to make them pay for the deficits that are coming up. Right now, that's about 7% of, of, uh, of, of a median earner of Social Security benefits. It would be, uh, it, well, that's a, it should be, instead of 2.1, that's 21%. It would go from some, something like 7% to 21% in a decade. 21% of, the, of your Social Security benefits would go to make paid your premiums. It would be almost 50% in 20 years. By the end, by, by the time your children, if they're 20 years old now, get to their retirement, the Medicare premiums would be 110% of their Social Security benefits. Instead of getting a check, they would get a bill from Social Security to pay for Medicare if we let the elderly pay. Now, what's, the real big picture here is the green is the regular government. It's like 14% of, 13% of, of GDP. Everything else is Medicare and Social Security, and that's what's going to happen to it just over 20 years. Huge changes. What do we do? Well, we, we, well, we did. You know, I've, just, I've shown you one thing. I said we could pay for it with taxes. The young can pay. We can make the young pay. Uh, and as we, as we older people would say, you know, when we were your age, you know, it was 10 miles of school in the snow uphill both ways. You guys ought to tighten your belt, live, live, live frugally, and send us money. But if we're not going to do that, then what, 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 did, what did the government do? What did we do? Well, we, we passed Obamacare, as some people call it, but it's the, it's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, usually just called ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, what did we do? Well, we didn't do either one of the two things I talked about. We, we didn't make the young pay. We didn't make the old pay. Who did we make pay? How did we solve the problem? Well, we, we decided we would stop paying providers. We, we pretended to solve the problem, and I would say... I could say the reason that we did this pretending is that you wanted to pass a bill that cost less than a trillion dollars. Where do you save your money? Well, we could remember the way the Congressional Budget Office has to score these things. They have to do it for 10 years, and they have to accept whatever's in the bill. So what's in the bill was we will stop paying providers. In, in fact, you'll see what, what, what the outcome of that would be. And in fact, the Medicare trustees before it finally came out in August, and we'll talk about that very briefly. But what they did was to say, we'll make the providers pay for it, but we'll just not pay them. Now, they might not show up for work, and if they don't show up for work, and if you're on Medicare, you won't be able to find a doctor. 
and some of the hospitals will go out of business, but we'll just talk about what they did was to eliminate all of the hospital deficit completely. If, if what, what you do in the bill, it came out to be true. It, as I'd say, this is fiction. It's pretending. It's the Harry Potter wave the magic wand. It's almost as if the highway people and the federal highway people said, you know, we don't have enough money. Let's have the force of gravity. And so they just have the force. Now we need half as much steel and half as much cement to build highways. Now, as long as no trucks ever go on the highways, we'll be fine. If we don't drive on them, they'd look great. But if we drive on them, it's not going to happen. Making it up won't solve any of these problems, and that's what this bill does. Here's the effect on the level of per capita, the amount they're going to plan on spending you per capita in the bill, because what they're going to do is just pay providers less. So they're just going to spend less on everybody. And they're going to spend $2,300 less in, the, in, in a decade, $53,000 less by 2030. These are gigantic numbers. This is a huge reduction in Medicare benefits. Now, and this, uh, well, I'm going to leave that one. But uh, here are the spending reductions. If you're, 60, if you're turning 65 today, you're just retiring, you're the, you're the present value of what Medicare is going to expect to give you, according to this bill, is, is $35,000 less than you would have gotten before. Now, we know we're going to have to pay for this. This is one way to pay for it, except that, of course, that $35,000 coming out of the pockets of doctors and, and everybody else, because that's how they're going to get it. If you're 55, you're going to lose 62000 If you're 45, you're losing 105000 That's how much they're taking away from you. What's astounding, uh, this is what Medicare reimbursements are going to look like. They're right now 80% of what it really costs to, do, to provide the care. But in, in less than 20 years, it'll be down to 68% of what it costs to provide the care. 62% and then just half of what it really costs. You know that what that means. What that means is that uh, the facilities that have negative, and remember, there, there are no such things as nonprofit hospitals that operate. There are tax-exempt hospitals and non-tax-exempt hospitals, but hospitals that don't make a profit go out of business. And... The chief actuary at CMS estimates that 15% of those within nine years will be going out of business. That 25% of them in 20 years will go out of business. The only way not to go out of business is to get rid of your Medicare patients. But how do you do that? Because what we're doing is we're going to have twice as many Medicare patients. You know, everybody can't have fewer Medicare patients. The only way we can do it is some other ways. And this is, this, is, this is unheard of. This is the chief actuary at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. He's the guy who, when I, when I was a trustee, that we gave him the assumptions we wanted to make. And this is the guy who does the calculations. At the end of the trustee's report, this is, instead of saying, I agree with the trustee's report, this is what he said. He encourages reader to review the illustrative alternative projections based on more sustainable assumptions on physician and other Medicare price updates. He's essentially saying the bill is fiction and we should ignore it. Uh, now, this, this guy, uh, Rick Foster, is a wonderful guy. You know, the, neither of the last two administrations liked him. So he, whatever, whatever the administration, the White House likes to say, if he doesn't agree with it, he comes out and says, this isn't going to work. And, and his, he's, he did that when we passed the Medicare Modernization Act in 2003, and he did it again here. Uh, now this, I don't know, a lot of people here are on Medicare, right? How many people are on Medicare? Yeah, you got that note. Do you remember that thing? That when the bill was passed, they sent this thing. The first two paragraphs have totally false. And just imagine a government sending you something that's totally false, and this one outlines it. Here's what it says. The needed improvements that will be, these are needed improvements that will keep Medicare strong. Your guaranteed Medicare benefits won't change, whether you get them through original Medicare or Medicare Advantage. Of course, they're cutting Medicare Advantage in half. So <laughs> if you got it through Medicare Advantage, you're in deep trouble. Instead, you'll see new benefits and cost savings and an increase. I mean, this cannot happen. This is all, they made it up. And to send this out, I found unconscionable. Now, this is something that... Uh, 
Congressman Brady will be thinking about, because this is Rivlin Ryan, Paul Ryan is a congressman from uh, Wisconsin, a very good guy. And they're talking about, how do we change Medicare? What, what indeed can we do? Because we're gonna have to do something, we know that. How do we get markets to work in Medicare? Well, one way to do that is something that was really suggested in the, uh, in the Clinton White House. They had a bipartisan commission on reforming Medicare. I testified before it three times. When I testified, I was the only person testifying about ways to fund Medicare. Everyone else thought the way to solve Medicare's problems was to give their group more benefits. You can't increase everybody's benefits and solve, anybody's, and solve a financing problem. You've got to find a way to do it. This program sets up a voucher program that says that can do exactly what the Affordable Care Act pretends to do. That is, give seniors a voucher to go out into the market and, and buy health insurance. Uh, and that way, the providers still get paid. You'll be able to get health insurance. You won't have to go into a system like the British have, which if, this, if the current bill would continue, might be what we have to do. Because if you can't find a doctor, you'll have to go outside Medicare to find someone. We can't force the doctors to, to take you, and that's an issue. Maybe they could do that in the Soviet Union. We can't do that here. And I think that's a real problem. This plan can work. Uh, the alternatives are, you know, the way health care is growing, and, I don't, and I'd like to say, maybe we want health care to grow. You know, we, we have to be a little careful about this. We get high quality care. And some people tell me, they say, you know, Japanese spend less than we do and they live longer than we do. And I say, well, let's, let's think about that. Japanese Americans in the U.S. live longer than Japanese Japanese. Maybe they live longer because we have better health care. Now the question is, I wouldn't say that's the reason. I, I don't know the reason. But I think those little simple ways of thinking about the world where the other countries ration health care and we don't ration it, we're going to ration it if we do what we have here. Uh, the Rivlin Ryan can solve some of these problems, but uh, the, the point of this is that these things are growing. We may want them to grow. We may want to have better health care, but we're going to have to pay for it. There's no doubt that seniors are going to have to pay for more of their health care if you're going to do any kind of responsible reform. And I think that we can do that reform. Rivlin Ryan is a good start on that reform because what we need to do is we have to make uh, the providers of health care care how good the quality is and care what it costs. And the only way we can do that is if we make you care what it costs because you're going to watch them. Just like you watch the people at the grocery store. As I used to tell my fellow trustees, why do you think we don't need federal agents at the grocery store to make sure that the grocery clerk is not upcoding the prices? because every one of us cares. If we don't care, we're not gonna solve this problem. And we're gonna to have to design a system where we do care, where we have a role to play in what's going on. We can make choices and we can do that. Uh, what can we do? Somehow we're gonna to have to set aside that. I've testified many times about this. Somehow we have to set aside funds while we're working to pay for our retirement. It's too late for some of us because we're, the baby boomers are already ready to retire. We, we could say, as I, could, I would tell Tom here, that he, because he lived in this big generation and we didn't have many retired people, his taxes that he paid were too low. Well, oops, I don't, nope, nope, no, I, I can already see that he doesn't agree with that. Well, they, you know, uh, what, the way they solved Social Security in 1983 was to raise taxes, get all kinds of surpluses, and spend the money. And so you'll hear maybe about the trust fund. I'm not talking about the trust fund here. I got in all kinds of trouble talking about it many times, but, you know, what happens is they raise your taxes, you paid extra taxes, then they declared this trust fund, which was then a commitment to ta that you got to pay taxes again. The bigger the trust fund is, the worse off you are because it's a commitment for you to pay more taxes in the future because they didn't save the money. They spent it. Now, this guy's trying to prevent that from happening. The bottom line is we can do reform. We can do it. I'm hoping that it's going to get done this time. Uh, but it's not free. We can't do this free. We can't take those giant deficits and make them go away. Somehow, the elderly are going to have to share the costs of these programs with their children and grandchildren in some way. We're going to have to let them pay lower taxes than they would have to pay if we, if we kept it all, and we're going to have to pay for more of it than we would have to pay 
And, and that's, uh, there isn't any solution to that other than that. We're going to have to do, do something. The way we do that reform, the more we can make the market work and make these guys who are providing health care do exactly what the people in cosmetic surgery have done in LASIK surgery, where prices have fallen over the last two decades instead of rising because people care what it costs. I think mean, we can solve some of these problems, but otherwise we can't do it. And I'm hoping that, uh, that Congressman Brady is going to be leading the charge to do these things. And, and they are going to address this entitlement issue. And it's the biggest part of the deficits from 2014 to 2020 are, are entitlements.